Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Wall Street Wildlife. Three big topics for today. Christoph, what are we talking about? We are talking about your majestic 50 company portfolio overview. I've got three lessons, three lessons learned I'm going to relate. Yes, sir. And you, in your time in the casinos and at the poker tables, said something potentially very dangerous or very wise, a mantra to live by. You'll talk about that. And we will have the King of the Jungle portfolio review. And we'll tackle a slightly more serious topic as well as as the fun Neuralink. What's coming out of that lab? What have they just done? And what potential impacts is it going to have on society? The future is now. So Badger, you have been diligently, consistently, and really entertainingly posting on X and Instagram your portfolio holdings from lowest position up to bigger positions. And it has been a painful start to the journey because by necessity, I've spent about 20 days wading through all of my losses. So I feel like a bit of an idiot on platforms like TikTok and Instagram, because I'm basically here I am every day telling people how I've lost buckets and buckets of money, at least the people on X, Mm -hmm. of which there are nearly 7,000 now, excellent, Mm -hmm. uh, know that I am a serious investor, not just somebody who throws the money in the bin. Yeah, but you can't be an investor without losing. So let's right. So let's acknowledge that up front. It's the it's not so much whether you're going to lose, it's to what extent you can mitigate the losses, right? Yeah, yeah. When you like a, as you're a growth investor, right? I mean you can actually have eight losing positions and you know one winner that winner, if it's a nine bagger, 10 bagger, it outruns, it covers the losses of all the rest. So it's a it's a very asymmetric bet when you're investing in smaller companies with high growth potential. You know, as we say this, I think this is a more important point than I initially realized. My, my guess is most investors who are on the sidelines or only deal with index funds, say, or not at all, they're scared of picking a losing company because they know that the odds are not with you, right? So hearing you go over your portfolio review, going through all the investments that have lost you money, might that send the wrong message? I think the important thing is to learn from each one. And I will share a couple of learning points from the first 25 days. And I'm not trying to send a message to anybody. I'm just Mm -hmm. doing a 50 day review of everything I own and some stuff I previously owned. So I guess kind of wait for the conclusion and then hope I'll try and frame it in a nice package that makes it uh, uh, makes it less scary perhaps mm-hmm. than, you know, just a litany of failures. Yeah. So can, can you take us through some of these? So actually I'll say it might be overwhelming, you know, you're 50, 50 companies to tr- keep track of is a lot. And I don't think the intention here is to confuse people with what these companies do and it could seem overwhelming. However, my sense is that because you know these companies pretty well and you could talk about them in terms of the context of your own personal journey with them, tell us what surprised you the most about your overview so far. Yeah, so I suppose I'll pick out three lessons and I think I, I knew at least two of these and then one I've, I've sort of run into something new doing the review. Like I do do this. I've been doing this kind of annually ish for the last five or six years, last two years. I've done it in public on, on X and now on all the other platforms. So, um, maybe the first one, which is my biggest dollar loss lifetime is C limited. Mm. And for kind of complicated tax reasons, I wanted to invest in C for a couple of years and I watched my brother invest in it and do really well. And I was like, come on, I want to be able to invest in this thing. I need to open this particular kind of account that I didn't have. So when I finally got round to opening that account, which required moving some pension money around, basically, um, I thought, well, I know this company. I've been tracking it for years. Let's just get stuck in with a full position, which for me is about 6%. So that's like 6% of a relatively large pot. It's you know, still quite a large number. Um, and so I dive straight in. At 6%, as opposed to normally building a position slowly, I'd normally buy, Mm. like I say, a 2% position, let it run for a couple of quarters, monitor the thesis, add, give it a year, add again. That'd be my normal process. I added added the whole 6% in one go and literally 
I don't know, like two or three months later, boom, the ass fell out of Sea Limited because of poor execution. And that chunk of cash was down over 80%. And probably my pension manager was looking at me and going, what an effing idiot this guy is. He's just blown his, his pension and his life up. Um, I haven't. That was, you know, they don't know about a bun- another bunch of accounts that are more material than that one. Um, hey, Badger, could I, but- could I pause you for one second? What is it that made you so excited about this company? Is there anything, uh, uh, because you are a very measured, reasonable uh, furry critter most of the time. So it's it's unusual to hear you talk about, you know, needing, not needing, but, you know, this exuberance for C limited. Why? Like I love, I love the e-commerce sector. And one of some of my biggest holdings are Amazon at the time, Shopify, um, Mercado Libre today is probably top two or three highest conviction investments. And C Limited just seemed like Southeast Asia's version of those to me with its uh, e-commerce dominance. It was offering financial services that made a lot of sense. It had a really uh, interesting angle at the time, uh, an arm of the company called Garena, which was like digital entertainment, video games, essentially. Sounds a bit trite, but that was actually create funding a lot of the e-commerce growth. It seemed like this great flywheel. Um, but they and they, they executed badly. They, they got a bit big for their boots. And instead of investing locally in building an impenetrable moat around logistics, which is what companies like... Um, Amazon were doing and still are doing and Mercado Libre are doing in South America. Instead, C tried to take over the world and they got their arms and legs into company, countries like um, Poland, France. They were talking about the UK. They started building a presence in South America to compete with Mercado Libre. And it, that strategy blew up. They didn't have a competitive advantage in those markets. They didn't understand those markets. And, uh, and it, was, it really eroded margins and shareholders didn't like it. So um, that sent the share price, the multiple tumbling, which is where I lost my lost my pants on that investment. Yeah, looking at the chart, it's uh, if, if we zoom out the entirety of, of its history, it looks like a triangle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which is yeah. which is it's it's good if you're on the left uh if you're on the left leg, but if you're on the other side of that leg, it's not not yeah. as pleasant. I, I am a fan of the company still, and uh, and I have added to it actually a few months ago, um, and I do think it's got potential. Like the the threading the needle that their CEO Forrest Lee needs to achieve now is to return the company to sustainable, profitable growth, and so that means focusing on core markets. They slash and burned costs about six months, nine months ago. And now they're starting to cautiously reinvest in things like sales and marketing Mm -hmm. and building their logistics capability. In the recent earnings, they talked about some of the benefits of some of those reinvestments they're starting to make. So I do think the company's doing a good job of a turnaround. And I do think it's probably a quite a reasonable valuation, but no argument. This is a very high risk position today. It's in my too hard bucket. Yeah, I I get that. And uh, by that... You know, sometimes even if you've been investing for a long time, I think it's humbling to say not my region of the world, uh, too many things going on. I don't have any, any reason to feel confidence because, you know, like that not living there. No idea. Everything is hearsay. So, yeah. I agree, agree. Uh, but then I could say the same about Mercado Libre. Like I've visited South America, but that's about the extent of it. Mm-hmm. I've tried to use the app, and I don't speak any Spanish, so I struggled with it. Um, but I still consider it a high conviction pick. Although that feels different to me, and I wonder why. Uh, to me, the Amazon of South America, it's it's fantastic financial results over so many years. Uh, really dedicated and focused team. That feels like the mission is clear, and you know they're they're mirroring Amazon and just you know doing doing that better feels different to me than C Limited because maybe the game sector and the social platform. So, uh, it, good point, right? You don't need to live somewhere; it helps, but also the numbers don't lie. So when you look at Mercado Libre's chart, it's up and to the right. C's is not so additional complexity. Yeah. That's, that's interesting, actually, because that takes me on to the second lesson 
I've learned during the portfolio review. And this is a company I tweeted about today as the, we're recording on the 25th of March. This is WISE, um, the sort of international banking foreign exchange experts. And um, something I recognize very strongly is I really, really understand this company. And it's because I'm a customer. I'm not just a sh- I was a customer before I was a shareholder. And I was so impressed with the capability and the service uh, that I thought I need to buy stock in this company. And it's become a, becoming a core holding. Um, so that's very different to uh, Mercado Libre and C, where like I'm not a customer and probably never will be. Um, it does give you a great lens into what a company does. And I try and be a customer of all the companies I own if I can, probably apart from my medical technology companies. I'll try and avoid those as long as I can. Awesome. And the third lesson? You've got to track the metrics. So a company I've owned for some time is Cloudflare, ticker NET. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're kind of a cybersecurity and edge computing uh, leader. Uh, And I think I I do understand the company. Like I've used their tools as a free user. I understand what's going on. But you've got to study the financials. And one thing I hadn't realized until I did my portfolio Mm -hmm. review of that one was their Dubna is collapsing so just to explain what that is, dollar base net retention. And it's, an, it's a good metric to track for SaaS companies, software as a service companies. It's basically from your existing customer base for every dollar they spent last year, are they spending like $1.20, $1.30 this year? It's showing real customers are getting real economic value and thus they're giving you more wallet share. Like it's, it's a real kind of show me the money metric. And their Dubna is now down to... 115%, which means they're still, it's still increasing, but really you're looking for like 120% plus. So it's kind of showing either their customers are uh, maxed out on their, or maxing out on their use of the platform, or maybe they're finding alternative solutions. So it's just, it's on basically, it's, it's under the uh, microscope for me now. I'll be tracking this one pretty carefully for the next couple of quarters to make sure it's on track. And if it's not, like I'm not afraid to cut bait with this. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. I, I I know Cloudflare pretty well, but I wonder. It, it's so some of this stuff is really complicated, uh, in the sense that there's so many metrics to follow, and oh. Cloudflare uh, is, I think, its mission statement is providing the sh- inventing a better internet. Everything from physical locations of the servers being all over the world to the security angle, it's all interwoven. And I wonder, Badger, if the number that you, the dollar ba- the dollar net base retention rate in isolation, is that enough of a view in a company to say, uh-oh, we have serious issues, especially as it's expanding and companies are in many different stages of growth. That's point one. And uh, and the second point I want to ask you about is you said in passing that the number you want is about 120. Is that is that a rule or is that kind of relative to the top tier performers? There's a bunch of metrics you should look at. And that's just one of the ones I look at for that company. Um, and I said, probably it's not the absolute number. It's probably the trajectory of that number is coming down and it's coming down a little faster than I'd like for what is supposed to still be a growth company that's relatively early stage. The reason that's so scary, not yet, yeah, I suppose scary for an investor is particularly these kind of mid cap tech companies, SaaS companies, they're, they're valued so much more on their future potential than like their earnings today. And so if investors start to get a sense that growth is slowing and these companies are entering like a, a maturity phase sooner than you would expect, then that's going to smash the valuation materially. So that's why I'm just trying to get like a leading metric that gives me a sense of if that might be coming so I can try and basically get out before the market catches wind. That's the, that's the only thing. That's right. There's a whole bunch of other natural metrics I track and they all, you know, they're all healthy, but this is one kind of yellow flag, let's say. And Cloudflare in particular has a history where it was probably the most wildly valued company in the entire stock market <laughs> during the uh, 2021 bull before yeah. interest rates start creeping up. And the stock yeah. got, yeah, it lost. I mean, I, I could look it up, but it lost 
over 50% in its value. More like, yeah, 70 or 80%, I think. I, this is in, in my tweet for this one. Like, I'm not a trader, but I describe myself as trading this one. Mm-hmm. It's the only one, one of the only stocks where I've uh, bought a position. I, I sold a big chunk of my position actually like a month before the, the triangle turned south, mm-hmm. like just luck, luckily. And, um, and then I've re-added to it since then, uh, kind of near the base. So I've kind of played this one by luck, perhaps more than judgment, pretty smartly. So why, so why still hold it? You have this relatively, I mean, you have this legitimate flag. It's still very expensive. The market is very, very uh, exuberant still. Why? And I, I imagine you have other companies in the cybersecurity uh, mega trend that you don't have these flags about. What's what's uh, what's your rationale for not selling right now? Like it's still providing an essential service, and it still has potential to be like the next, essentially the next hyperscaler. Like that's how they were, they were sort of positioning themselves to to be almost a challenger in one domain to things like um, GCP and AWS and uh, Azure. Um, but it's primarily in my mind, it's a cybersecurity company. And I want, but this is my, my strongest held conviction that cybersecurity stocks are going to continue to do incredibly well from here, even though arguably they're overvalued. I've got such a big position in cloud, so crowd strike. I've got a smaller position now in Zscaler, quite a new addition. Um, I've got a smaller position still in Palo Alto Networks, which is probably arguably the weakest of, of the four. Um, and then Cloudflare is my fourth one, um, which I've got kind of on a on a short rope, let's say. If I were to sell the ones I don't necessarily have full conviction in, which would be Palo Alto and Cloudflare, well, I'm left with just two, and two is not really enough of a basket for me. Mm. Yeah, that's... Let me, let me say it another way. I would rather own a middling company mm. in a, an industry I'm certain is going to expand. I would rather hold that than a fantastic company in an industry I think is just going to kind of poodle along. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate the basket approach, but I also appreciate the history of a company that is so richly valued. And that number you mentioned, net dollar-based retention rate, may or may not be a canary in the coal mine. So it's interesting for me, you know, in this moment of my investing journey, I'm mostly sitting out you know, almost all of my investments are uh, in crypto or small caps, which I don't have, you know, necessarily much faith in. The only real company, real meaning excellent company that I own is Tesla. So I'm sort of looking at your portfolio review and these um, decisions to add, sell, allocate from a, I think, fairly neutral standpoint, because I could, you know, should I add should I buy? Should I? Uh, I can't sell. And your description of Cloudflare Flare at the moment does not convince me to add shares. And that's one, yeah. I think, of the fallacies that most investors, you know, it's very understandable succumb to is because they've, because if you already own it, it's harder to sell it because you're attached to it. The question I try to fl- flip around is if you did not own it today, would you buy it? And I think rationally speaking, the and since you have it in your portfolio, if you're not succumbing to bias, would be you would in this moment buy shares of Cloudflare if you did not already own them. It's a good question. And I do challenge myself with that one. Like I do have transaction costs and other things. So there is a little bit of a like a la- like a, a bias towards inaction. This might this is so on the edge. This is probably one I wouldn't buy if I didn't mm. own it. Yeah, but this is like, there's very few where they sort of sit in that such a gray zone, but this is probably one of those. Yeah, that's an interesting insight and it's complicated. You know, the feeling on the inside, kind of knowing this <laughs> this tension exists. Yeah. So in, you- yeah, if I, if I just the, the nature of the way my accounts work, because it's some of this weird British tax efficient thing that means I have to settle into sterling. I can't settle into dollars. So if, when I, if I were to buy something and then subsequently sell it, I'm going to pay the FX rate plus the mm. bid offer spread. And then when I sell, I'm going to pay the bid offer spread and then the FX rate again. So overall, that adds about, 
I don't know, probably three to four percent to my transaction cost. Yeah. So stuff that sits in the gray, like I don't know, like yeah, it's it's a it's a problem that most investors won't have, but it's good it's a kind of a good problem yeah. because it always yeah. I have to be really sure before I hit that trade button. And that's why yeah. you know I trade far less frequently than most people. Makes sense. And that served you well. <laughs> <laughs> so less, yeah. right? Like less is more. I wish I had some, some uh, British tax to, to have kept me from selling at the wrong time. But like, I mean, if you want some, if you want some help, like every time you transact, if you just send me five percent in cash, and then that'll be your waiting. There you go. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah, That's brilliant. All right. So, Badger, something else fascinating happened to you in in uh, your stay in Tahoe. You were minding your own business. <laughs> just keep keep keeping keeping your eyes focused right on on business and all of a sudden lo and behold you find yourself sitting at a uh table poker table poker game and what do i get at three in the morning but a photo showing your uh royal uh not royal flush straight flush right it wasn't quite royal but it was straight and it was flushy so <laughs> and uh with a quote on X saying money one is 10 times sweeter than money earned. And I heard you describe this as your life mantra. <laughs> well, certainly when I play poker with my buddies, if I can winning their money is, I can, you know, the gloating that comes with that, that's far more sweet than just winning money from a random person or earning money from a, you know, your, the toil of your labors in a job. It does feel like you're taking money from the evil house right in the case of casino right but, but even then like I, i'm looking forward to winning your money in austin oh, this week. Oh, that'll, be sweet money. <laughs> that'll be sweet money <laughs> man that's gonna be so unfair i haven't i haven't played cards in in over a couple of years and you've been rounding now pretty diligently so oh boy i feel like a fat you know uh overweight <laughs> out of shape person uh you know towing the line on the track so this will this will be uh <laughs> gotta i gotta get a couple of <laughs> stretches in before <laughs> anyway follow-up question badger do you think there's a sense in which people like us who enjoy not the thrill of victory but like the co competitive nature and the kind of personalized in interactions when you're winning versus just you know money piling up do you think that's one of the draws for us and maybe others for why investing is such a fascinating lifelong project that there's something sweeter in a sense to winning your money through hard work and analysis and discipline as opposed to just say buying a fund and f checking on it 10 years later yeah that's interesting isn't it um like i i i suppose when i got started personal anecdote um I used to sort of co-invest with my buddy, Albert, uh, my podcast co-host from Telescope Investing years ago. And he's still, you know, my closest friend. Um, and we, we had, a, we used to check in with each other on how we would do our results. And I called it the game. And the game was to basically um, have them have more money than the other person. Mm -hmm. And uh, Albert won the game because he retired about two years before I did. Um <laughs> But the game is still ongoing, even if he doesn't admit to it. The game is still ongoing, and I'm still growing faster than he is, and I will pass him in the game at some point. And that's actually more important to me in some ways, daft, than than the actual, you know, the real dollars and the fact that they're funding like a very fun lifestyle right now. Uh, so yeah, gamifying stuff can can be good as well because it, it uh, maybe it can instill better behaviors and thinking. You don't suddenly panic and go. Like, holy F, I've just lost like more than a year's salary on this C limited thing. And suddenly, you know, go crying yourself to sleep. You're just like, oh, I've like, you know, I took a gamble in the game. It didn't pay off, but I've got these other bets over here. You know, you can re remain focused on perhaps the things, perhaps the, the right behaviors that are going to drive you to long term success. This is an important point. I, I didn't expect our conversation to go this way, but accountability. We know the phenomena of how much easier it is to go to the gym when somebody is going to be there at 6 a.m. waiting for you. I mean, I, for one, like to think of myself as a person who is true to their word, so I'm going to show up anyway, 
all the time or 99% of the time. But when I know somebody is with me on a journey, it actually makes it easier to show up. There's a sense of looking forward to doing the workout. I think your insight about gamifying investing, especially if you're a new investor and it feels scary to you to go on this journey all alone, don't. Find somebody that you are close to and start small and turn it into a game. And it's amazing how much you care, even though the stakes might not be that big. We could testify to this with our current King of the Jungle portfolio challenge, can't we? For real, yeah. <laughs> which which is which ain't going so good for monkey uh <laughs> poor humble monkey every decision he makes not every decision most of the decisions i've made so far have not yet paid off and the gap the delta between badger's portfolio and humble monkey's portfolio is widening and continuing continuing to widen so that's the bad news i haven't seen the uh i haven't seen the portfolio snapshot Chuck it on screen. Let's see what's what's happened. Yeah, w- what's happening is that Badger's portfolio is somewhere around the eighteen hundred dollar mark, approximately. So from a base of fourteen hundred, that's about up four hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Whereas Monkey's more sine wave like uh, <laughs> graph is hanging around eleven hundred or twelve hundred. So I'm about down $200. So there's about a gap of $600 between Badgers and Monkeys. So in one sense, so far, this is validation to invest only in the best businesses and don't muck around too much and the results will follow, right? That's your finger wagging. Whereas my bets have all been mostly I have three companies in my portfolio outside the bets against a commercial real, real estate. Um, I have Coheres and I have EOS and I now have a Bitcoin miner, Iris Energy. All three of those are small caps and all three of those have not moved with the market's exuberance, which is an interesting data point by, that I want to run by you or, or, or talk through. I'm confused by this market. To be honest, mm-hmm. Th- there's it's it's this sense I have that the the problems with inflation and higher cost of living and high debt and all that when 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 the Fed basically said we're about to ease the market took off that was about November and it seems like the majority of companies that benefited from this were the Magnificent Seven and AI companies like Nvidia. But when you look at the rest of the world's companies, which is basically almost all of them, they're kind of, you know, they're not following along with this with this exuberance. I don't really know what to make of it. And I'll tell you the one thing I'm hanging on to so far. I know in my investing experience that patience is probably the virtue that will make more money for you than anything else. I can't count the number of times where I was right about a certain company or idea and the company would continue to execute and the story would continue to develop but the stock price just stayed the same in fact activision was is, comes to mind immediately like there was a several year period <laughs> where where what i just described happened and then of course for for reasons that i think are belong to the complex c- systems bit, you never know when the price of a equity will decide, <laughs> in quotes, seemingly out of nowhere to follow the fundamentals. And so as I'm still looking at my portfolio, sorry for this little sermon or whatever it is, confession mm-hmm. maybe, I'm looking at Coheris and Eos and Iron, and I continue to really love the story of those three. And I still see potential uh, multi-baggers in all three, but as of now, that ain't happened in the share price. So I'm trying to resort to not panicking, not saying I've been wrong, not getting bearish on them and staying patient and just letting you spank me for now 
hope you know hopefully by hoping that by november things will be different i suppose we always said right from the start this is kind of an it's, it's a bit of a game for the podcast it's a bit of an artificial competition because one year is not enough time to judge uh the results of an investor's track record we had one of our very active subscribers on the discord uh a few days ago or a few weeks ago perhaps um bemoaning the fact that they've been an investor for two years and they've only just got back to their sort of starting point in terms of their investment, like their break even, like where's my returns? You can't judge your results mm -hmm. over much less than a five-year term, or arguably a 10-year term. It's just volatility. You could sit at the poker table for two or three nights. You could win or you could lose heavily. It doesn't necessarily tell you whether you're a good player. That's yeah. just like volatility and luck. You have to play 10,000 hours, like in, if you're a live player, like a year plus before you start to see the your decisions washing through just the randomness and to see whether you were winning or a losing player. And so, yeah, like if you've, if you started investing a couple of years ago, this has probably been a pretty hard time for you. And in the game, um, you know, you've taken a very extreme strategy and thus far it hasn't played out. And if let's be honest, like it's probably not going to play out by the end of the competition. I'm probably going to win the contest. That doesn't mean you were wrong. It just means over the time frame. The arbitrary time frame where we just, the game started and finished you know your your strategy didn't trigger doesn't mean it's wrong just means the timing was wrong well i like savable receipts that's definitely that quote there is definitely going to be <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> saving that one but but you're so right time frame makes all the difference and people mm. could get psyched out in fact time frame is what differentiates the different games you could play between being you know a daily trader doing nothing but math being a momentum trader which has a longer time frame being some kind of medium term swingish in investor and then a long term buy and hold it's not that any one of those strategies is necessarily right or wrong but you need to know the game you're playing with each of them in time frame is probably the thing that gets overlooked more than anything else, right? Knowing that that's the integral ingredient that tells you how you should act with what you do. But you're doing the right thing, which is you're not just, you haven't bought these things and now you're just kind of sitting back and waiting for something to happen. Like you are rechecking them every quarter. You're reviewing the earnings and like monitoring the thesis. And presumably like if, if EOS, if you finally come to the conclusion, this is a dead duck, like the rest of the market seems to think it might be, Presumably, at some point, you will exit that position. You're not just going to hang on just in case. With EOS, no. Uh, the moment, the yeah, the moment something breaks, which in this case would be financing, I would sell unless the stock like crater is eighty percent first. In which case, the risk, you know, I, it, yeah, there's no reason to to hang on to dead dead ideas. So yeah, but yeah. Uh, so we shall see. The last thing though about this game that I think we weren't necessarily expecting, but that I'm thrilled by is, yes, we, to make things interesting, you need markers, you need checkpoints. So of course, a year checkpoint is, call it one lap around the track. But the moment we realize that this will be a competition that will be ongoing for years and years, as long as you don't run into a tree skiing 100 miles an hour down a mountain, <laughs> uh, and I don't know what what is it that could some some tiger eats me swinging from the trees. It'll be fascinating, I think, for us to see uh, you know who win who, who consistently wins and what happens to the delta of the portfolio and the co compounding effect and all of that. But I will I will confess to you one hundred percent this competition regardless of the small amount that we have in it. I treat those selections like you were saying, very, very carefully. I am, uh, it, it, it creates that competitiveness creates a higher, higher stakes that are not monetary. And sometimes in life, what we have, the most important things are honor, <laughs> honor, <laughs> pride, right? Respect, dignity. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, like, I'm delighted if the game continues uh, for decades to come because Albert, and stop playing the actual game with me, even though I'm still keeping score. So if I can keep score with you instead, yeah. that absolutely suits me. And in my portfolio in King of the Jungle, 
I mean, I've, I think I own about eight or nine things now. These are among the highest conviction stock holdings I have in my real money portfolio. Mm-hmm. So it totally reflects yeah. my true thesis. Okay. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Neuralink's activities? You're a bit of a sci-fi guy, right? Yeah, Neuralink have been in the news in the last week. A really incredible uh, live stream that the company shared. They've now got a, a like essentially a real human trial, and they uh, they had a chap they've been working with who unfortunately is uh, quadriplegic, so paralyzed from the shoulders down. And in the video, he's chatting to a Neuralink researcher and. Mm-hmm. The guy's sat in front of his computer and he's playing chess. He's basically controlling the computer, controlling the mouse and the the pointer uh, with his mind just by thinking about it. Um, And this was, this is very early in the long-term vision for this company, but this is certainly a really important, tangible step forward in terms of brain computer interfaces. It's astonishing. It's, It's really astonishing, especially in the context of AI. You know, one thing, this is a little bit of a segue, uh, forgive me, but who's the man behind Neuralink? Yeah, it's uh, it's our friend Elon Musk. Yeah, and you know what's fascinating to me is his image is now so politicized, polarized. There's so many people who think he is maybe one of the most evil humans on the planet. Just they can't, they can't say enough horrible things about his egomania and so forth. And yet, <laughs> when you think of him founding another company that helps a quadriplegic communicate and play chess with his mind on top of, you know, electric vehicles being good for climate change. I mean, it's just one of these stories. I, I don't even know what to think anymore of, of Eon, whether he's an asset to companies or uh, who, who this guy is. And so, you know, that's an obvious tangent, not about Neuralink, but well, let me look. So, do you, do you know why Elon founded Neuralink? What the long term vision is for this company? Because it's very interesting. Uh, so, uh, so essentially, uh, it's to prevent like artificial superintelligence taking over the world, um, okay. and it's to make humans uh, competitive. And so, um, I, I believe this is why Elon founded the company. And like we're now seeing, you know, this is like stage. 0.1 with this brain, this first bit of the brain computer interface where now a human is able to control a computer. But at some point on version 20 or something, the vision is that not only are we essentially sort of controlling, but we we could also receive information from a computer. And so like I'm, I'm not uh, probably not a Musk fan personally these days. I'm somewhat ambivalent. His idea here, and it could hold water, is... Um, like it's an engineering problem between basically uh, like our ability to have, you know, recollection and memory and processing capacity. His idea is a bit like, you know, if you have your computer connected to the cloud and, you know, I've got my laptop and it's got, you know, how many, it's got like a terabyte of memory on it and it's got like a little limited processor. But when I log into Google, like I'm running stuff in the cloud on Google's servers and there I have, you know, multiple terabytes of storage and videos and everything else. And if I want to, you know, do stuff, I can I can have it running in the cloud and then the result comes back to my computer. Well, this is Elon's idea with the brain, essentially. If he can build what he described as a high enough bandwidth connection between the human brain and the cloud, um, then the, have you heard of brain plasticity? Mm-hmm. You know, when you sit behind the wheel of your car, right? And at some point you become a competent driver, Mm-hmm. unconsciously competent and the car almost feels like an extension of your brain right and you you become much more adept at controlling it and reacting to what's going on well elon's engineering idea here is that if you can build a high enough bandwidth connection between your physical brain and the cloud well your brain plasticity means that suddenly you'll be using a lot of those cloud processing and storage capabilities just as part of your consciousness essentially and so his thought here is, if we can do that, then we become this sort of hybrid artificial superintelligence, as opposed to being that, that being some like alien thing that we've created uh, that we don't really have any control over. And we hope through solving the alignment problem that it's friendly to us. 
And I've got no idea. I mean, that's so, super science fiction, and we're nowhere near that. Like we're decades, if not centuries, away from being able to do that. But this is unarguably a step towards that. I'll say. I'll say. I think about this a whole lot. Uh, that I think we're already cyborgs. When I look at my the students in my classroom and the level of addiction they have to the phones, they're already. It's ju- it just the gadgets just happen to be in their hand. To me, there's okay. it's a matter of degrees whether the gadget is in your hand and you can't stop looking at it, or whether it's you know some wetware implanted in you. People are voluntarily implanting their gadgets already. The, the other thing I want to say is. There's a fantastic resource about the origins of Neuralink by a fantastic online blogger, Tim Urban, at a site called Wait But Why. If you Google Wait But Why and Neuralink, you'll get to his many, many, many page detailed understanding of both the brain and what Elon is doing. And then the front of that blog is a little cartoon. He draws fantastic stick figures where you see two stick figures talking to one another. Elon says, Hey, you know, hello. And he says, I want to build a wizard hat for the brain as, <laughs> as what this company is doing. So that's right, Badger, because AI wasn't enough for humans to contend with. Now we have, you know, uh, this company turning us into literal hybrids. It's a wild time to be alive. Well, and it's it is interesting as well, right? Because uh, Elon is famously uh, suing OpenAI at the moment, and OpenAI was supposed to be another one of his uh, attempts to prevent artificial superintelligence from killing us all. Um, you know, and maybe ar- arguably OpenAI are probably you know one of the closest, a, a lot or furthest down that journey. Maybe DeepMind and a few other labs as well, Anthropic. Um, but Elon believes they're not fulfilling the open AI aspect of their mission. And so, so he's taken them to court over that for perhaps misusing his shareholder funds and the PR that he's brought to them by associating his name with them. So hopefully Neuralink doesn't go the same direction, end up doing something dreadful that's kind of off mission. Um, to be seen. And speaking mm. of to be seen, rumor has it I'll be seeing uh, some kind of uh, furry critter coming, making his way to Austin, Texas, in uh in a couple of days so folks stay tuned for some <laughs> what might be wild and crazy adventures so we're uh, we're going to post today's episode on tuesday which is today i'm traveling to austin so uh if you listen to this and if you've got any thoughts on uh challenges adventures content that we should record when we're in the same room <laughs> arm wrestling you know who knows what um <laughs> then uh then let us know on the socials, give us a like and subscribe and give us some uh, suggestions for antics we should get up to over the uh, rest of this week. Indeed. And if you haven't yet, please check us out over at wallstreetwildlife.com where we have the 10 laws of the jungle ready for your downloading pleasure. These are the laws that will make you a better investor. We're both uh, tweeting furiously or posting furiously on X. You can find me at 7 Luke Hallard. And I am at Seven Flying Platypus. It's been a pleasure being with you today, Badger, until we meet in, f- in the flesh or in the fur. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't look forward to it more. Fantastic. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.